Well, children, before there was a thing called YouTube, the adults might remember this, before there was a thing called YouTube and Facebook, there was this amazing TV show. It was so great. It was called America's Funniest Home Videos. Oh, it was so good. I, when I was a child, I loved this TV show. And what would happen was people would take videos of stuff and they would send it in because you didn't have the internet. I know, it's amazing. Didn't have computers. We used to write things on stone tablets. We were so old. Um, but no, we, we used to have these TV boxes and they were about, you know, this big, about this. Uh, anyway, we used to watch America's Funniest Home Videos. And on America's Funniest Home Videos, you'd get these little clips of hilarious things happening. And one of my favorite was always the sledding incident. There'd almost always be someone on a snow sled. And I can remember sitting with my family and this guy coming down this snow sled. It was just amazing, this huge big hill. And he comes flying down this thing and he goes careening and then he goes straight into a pole. He crashes into it between his legs. And me and my brothers all went, ooh, and my mum burst out laughing. And... And it's funny, isn't it, how one person in the room can laugh and everyone else can go, ooh, or this happens with TV shows. Have you ever noticed how sometimes you watch something and everybody laughs but others don't? When I was a kid or a teenager, there was a TV show, and this will get some to cringe and some to enjoy, called Monty Python. And so immediately 50% of the people in the church are going, oh, how would you ever watch that? And half are going, that's the best thing ever made. And some people found it funny and some people didn't. Some people found it just weird. And some people thought it was the best intellectual humor ever created. You know, there are things in this world that are really, really jarring and they make people take sides immediately. But there's one thing in this world that forces everybody to take a different side. Do you know what that is? It's, oh, good try. It's the cross. It's what God has done in the cross. Because in the cross, everybody has something happen to them. And they see the cross as either folly, foolish, stupid, dumb, or the power of God unto salvation. And we're going to be looking at that tonight. And the question for you guys and for all of us, for all the people that are here, is... What do we think of the cross? What does the cross do for us? Does it cause us to go, this is just nonsense? Or does this cause us to worship our God because he loved us so much that he would give us his son? There's only one of two responses you can have. And he gives it to us freely in Jesus. Power to be saved. Let's pray and thank him for that. Father in heaven, we thank you for your infinite love in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you have given us the cross of Jesus, that Christ crucified is our creed. And we pray that we would come to Calvary and have our burdens taken away and worship you evermore. Thank you for these children, Lord. We pray that they would lay hold of all of the promises of salvation and all the promises of the covenant that you've given them. And they would would profess publicly what is true. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you here this evening, we're turning through to the letter to 1 Corinthians. It's Reformation Sunday today. And so this morning, Joshua talk to us about faith and grace and how we come to know the Lord and the beautiful acceptance we have in Him and the implications of that. And tonight we're thinking about the cross of Christ, as you would have picked up in our songs. And we're turning through 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want us to pick up in verse 17 and We'll read through to verse 25, but we're primarily just looking at verse 18 tonight. That was 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll be starting at verse 17. This is God's holy and infallible word for you tonight. For Christ 
did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word. And before we come to the preaching of his word, let us come before him in a time of prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Lord, we long to benefit from it, and yet we acknowledge that, that we cannot gain any spiritual good from your word unless your spirit illuminates it to our minds. Unless you give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to believe, it will be nothing to us, not because your word is, is insufficient, but Lord, because our hearts are so dark because our minds are so distracted. And so, Lord, <clears throat> we just pray that right now your Spirit would attend the preaching of your Word, that, Holy Spirit, you would take the Word of God and seal it upon our hearts, that, Lord, we might look up and see Christ by faith standing at your right hand. Jesus, as I speak to human ears, would you speak to our hearts that each and every one of us might go away saying and knowing that we have heard the words of life, the word of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, let me just read those words again. 1 Corinthians 1.18 for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In 2002, there was a hymn written. It was a hymn written, and it contained the words, Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. I'm sure a whole bunch of you are probably thinking, oh, I know that one, I know that one, that's in Christ alone. Brownie points, you are correct, it is. 2002, that hymn was written, and it, it sort of gained traction very quickly in the church. Many people loved it, it was sung broadly. There was that period of time where it felt like every week you were singing in Christ alone at every single gathering that ever existed under the face of the planet. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, around about 2011, a great controversy was sparked because of the song. There was a huge push in the church to get Townend and Getty, the writers, to change it because of one line, one line, actually just one word of the hymn that caused huge controversy and infuriated people, and it was the word wrath. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. The word wrath 
People hated it. They hated it. Christian people, they hated it. We, no, the, the wrath of God's not satisfied. No, no, the love of God. That would be a, a more fitting word, the love of God maybe. And people started suggesting all sorts of different words. And, and Townend and Getty released a public statement and basically just said, we wrote it, it stays. The wrath of God was satisfied upon the cross. What is it about the cross? What is it about the wrath of God upon the cross that causes such a, a vile reaction from people? Do, do you find it strange? Because we look at the cross, don't we, and rejoice. But actually, isn't that weird? Now, I know, we're so used to being joyous about the cross that we forget how weird that actually is. Seneca, a man back in the Roman days, Seneca said that the crucifixion is so horrible, so disgusting, that it's not even fitting for Roman people to speak about it or even think about it. They, they shouldn't even know it exists. He's not saying it shouldn't happen. But, but you, you know, us sophisticated Roman people, we should know nothing about it. The, the cross, the cro we, sell, we hang it around our necks. Well, some of us do. We hang it, not, not commenting on appropriate nature of cross, but some of us, you know, we wear golden crosses. You're, we you're wearing a torture device around your neck. We, we celebrate a death vehicle. What, what? Isn't that weird? Well, the world thinks it's weird. The cross is the dividing line through the face of the earth. But it's not just the cross, Paul says, is it? Notice he doesn't say, for the cross is folly, and for the cross is the power of God, but for the word of the cross. What is this word? Now, tonight we're going to be thinking mainly about two things, which is the nature of this folly and this power that we see contrasted against one another in this passage. But before we do that, we need to think, what is this word of the cross that he's talking about? For the word of the cross is these things. What's in Paul's mind? What's he thinking of? Is he thinking about just the word cross? Is he thinking about just the word crucifix? There's, there's about four different major translations that, get, that come out in this section. You, you get word like we have here in the ESV. Your Bible, if you're using a different one, might have the message of the cross. You might have the doctrine of the cross. You might have the proclamation of the cross. Well, what is it? Literally, it is word, and that's the literally correct translation. But what's in Paul's mind when he says the word of the cross? What's he thinking of? If you look, if you look at the verse before, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize to preach the gospel. Sorry. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Then in verse 21, he says, It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. What's the big emphasis here? The preaching of God's word. The preaching of the cross. You see, though word is the correct translation, what's in the mind of Paul, I think, is the proclamation of the cross, the proclamation of Christ crucified. Hence, verse 23, we preach Christ crucified. The thing that is the dividing line through the center of civilization is the same as the centerpiece of our history, right? The crucifixion of Christ. And as the crucifixion of Christ, as the salvific work of Christ is proclaimed, week in and week out, Day in and day out, throughout the earth, it creates a response. It does something. The gospel we proclaim always causes an effect, right? There's only two effects at the end of the day, but it always causes an effect. We see this in 2 Corinthians. Have a look at 2 Corinthians with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 2.
from verse 14 onwards, we're going to read in a second, but just notice in verse 12 and 13, I came to Troas to preach the gospel. So he's in his mind is preaching, right? The preaching ministry that he fulfills. Verse 14, thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. And you think, oh, beautiful. You can picture it, can't you? As they, they go about through the earth, this beautiful knowledge aroma fills the earth around them like a glorious train behind a bride filling up the earth as they go from place to place. Verse 15, for we are the aroma of Christ to God. Be beautiful among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. The preaching of the gospel leads people from the state of dying to dying and from going from life to life. You see, it's this... It's this dividing line that separates two groups of people. Why? What is going on here? What is it about the preaching of the gospel that is so divisive? Uh, before we get to folly and power, just very briefly, consider what Paul says to the Galatians in Galatians 3 verse 1. He says to them, he says, before your very eyes, now remember, Galatia is not where Jesus died, right? Before your very eyes, Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Jesus wasn't publicly portrayed and crucified in Galatia. But Paul says that. What's he mean? Through the preaching of the cross, through the proclamation of the cross, through the word of the cross, Christ's salvific death and sanctifying and salvific work was so mightily portrayed that they could say, we saw Jesus upon a cross slain for sinners like a lamb led to the slaughter for us. That's what's so divisive about this. You see, as, as we were told this morning, or was it the Saturday? It's all a blur at this point. At some point we were told by someone, that, that the world loves a Jesus who blesses you and is kind, right? It loves a Jesus who's going to pat you on the back and say, go out and conquer and I'll be with you. The world hates a Jesus upon a cross. The world hates a dead Savior. The world doesn't want a dead Savior. The world wants someone that's going to bless them yeah. and make them feel good about themselves. But we have a crucified Savior. Oh, yes, we have a risen king, but we have a crucified lamb, right? What's seen in the heavens in Revelation? Who's upon the throne? A lamb that is slaughtered. The scars of his sacrifice upon his body. So what is this contrast? The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Who is, who is he thinking of when he, when he says that it's folly to those who are perishing? Who's in his mind? I know some of you are like, oh, that's easy, Logan. But you remember, Paul's not thinking of hypothetical people, right? But Paul's not thinking about people in, in long gone ages or, or people in other nations. Paul's thinking of his brothers. Paul's thinking of his tutors. Paul's thinking of family members and friends. Paul's thinking of fellow citizens of the same country. He, he's speaking of your work colleagues. He's speaking of your loved ones. He's speaking of everyone who is on the road to hell. He is thinking of every pers person who's on a path. You see, both these words, the perishing and the being saved, connote the idea of progress. Right? The, the progress, the direction of these people 
is perishing. Ruination, you might translate it. There are people who have been, who have been devoted to destruction. You remember that word in the Old Testament? When God says to Israel, when you come into the promised land, what I want you to do is I want you to devote them to destruction. Remember he said it to Samuel too? Go, go out to the Amalekites and devote them to destruction. Destroy everything. The people in the mind of Paul are all outside of Christ and every one of them is described as devoted to destruction, perishing on the way to ruination without help, without hope, save in the sovereign mercy of God. We confess that, don't we? Every time there's a profession of faith, what does the person acknowledge? That I am a sinner in the sight of God and without hope, save in the sovereign mercy of God alone. That is the state of these people. And, and as these people look, these enemies of the gospel, as Philippians would tell us, as they look at the cross, as they hear the public proclamation of the word of God, what do they think? What does it look like to them? Like stupidity. Like folly. Not only does it look foolish, but it generates more foolishness in their thinking. More foolishness in their heart. It is an object of scorn, an object of hatred. You might think about it folly, the way many of us think about things like the furry people. If you haven't heard of the furry people before, these are people who identify as cats and dogs and various animals. And they, you know, they get special tattoos and things put in places to make them look more like cats and they act like cats. A school recently said one of their students could identify as a furry and come to school as a cat. Uh, what do we think when we hear that? We're just like, these people are insane. That's exactly how the world views the preaching of Christ crucified. That exact attitude that you're thinking in your heart as you're hearing about furries is exactly what the world thinks of what I am doing right now. Don't you find that heartbreaking? That the place of salvation that we will look at shortly just looks like stupidity to them. It looks like folly. I mean, what's wrong with these people? What kind of religion wants a dead savior? And yet, brothers and sisters, we must be so careful because we can so fall into the trap of doing this, can't we? Maybe not explicitly like them, but like a practical atheist. We're not an atheist, but like a practical atheist, we can act like it when we begin to boast in anything that is not the work of Christ Jesus our Savior. You see, like, like the Corinthians, we can be tempted to put our trust to put our trust in anything except the cross, right? The cross, the cross was not sophisticated enough for the Corinthians. Some boasted in Paul. Some boasted in Apollos. Some boasted in spiritual gifts. Some boasted in miracles and he, all sorts of... We're experiencing the heavenly right today, they said. They put their boasting in things other than the cross. And we can do the same, can't we? We're tempted to put boasting in how much money we put in the box today. We're tempted to put boasting in the fact that we're pretty good Christians, unlike those people. We're tempted to put our boasting in the fact that, well, at least I don't commit adultery, or I don't murder people, or I'm not like that guy over there. I'm actually pretty reasonable. I'm actually kind to my wife. I know heaps of people who are way more jerkish than me. And we put, we're tempted, aren't we, to put our boasting in that, to put our boasting in our family, to put our boasting in our stuff, to put our boasting in our church, to put our boasting in our pastor, God forbid. That one's probably less of a temptation for us. But 
But it's a temptation, isn't it, to find stuff and things to put our hope in. And when we do that, we have practically become exactly the same as the atheist who looks at the cross with scorn. Uh, J.C. Ryle said so magnificently, Without Christ crucified in its pulpits, a church is little better than a dead carcass. A well without water, a barren fig tree, a sleeping watchman, a silent trumpet, a dumb witness, an ambassador without terms of peace, a messenger without tidings, a lighthouse without a fire, a stumbling block to weak believers, a comfort to infidels, a hotbed for formalism, a joy to the devil, and an offense to God. True? I mean, what good are we if we don't preach Christ crucified? We might as well pack up shop and go home. You see, the perishing ones like Ahab look at a prophet like Micaiah and say, I don't like him. He never says nice things about me. When what desperately Ahab needs is the true word of God. And so too for us, brothers and sisters. So too for us. Maybe, maybe you're sitting here tonight and, and you're, you're one of the perishing ones. Maybe you've never, maybe you've never come to know Christ. Maybe, maybe you've sat in church your whole life and you've never known Christ. And actually you're sitting here and you're thinking, it's all a bit of a farce. I mean, they serve great food at church, but it's all a bit of a farce. Maybe you're sitting here thinking to yourself, you know, I just don't buy it, Logan. I mean, it's just a cross. It's not very important. The whole thing's a bit of a joke. Can I just say to you, if that's you tonight, can I just say to you, beware. Beware. Because you might be one of the ones on the road to damnation. God's, God's offer of salvation will not be offered forever. And if you're, if you're sitting here and you're tempted to boast in things, you consider yourself a believer, but you're tempted to boast in things that are not the cross, run, run to the cross. As we're going to see in a second, there is only one hope, right? And it's not your bank balance. It's not your Kiwi saver. There is but one hope. And it is the cross the proclamation of a crucified Savior who would die to save His people. And that brings us to the second point, doesn't it? You see, because there is this group, there is this group called perishing ones, and oh, how they need the gospel, right? They need to hear this. Before we move on, we, they need to hear this. Brothers and sisters, we need to tell them. A Spurgeon, he, he says, if they're going to go to hell, let them go to hell with us holding on to their waists and clinging to their feet and letting them run and run with us dragging behind them. Don't let them walk freely into the hell. Do we have that heart? Do you see the nature of the perishing ones? Oh, how they need the gospel. Remember, Jesus, go out into the highways and the byways and force them to come in. Brothers and sisters, let us go and force them to come in here. They need to hear Christ. Don't be ashamed of saying to your family and your friends, come to church with me on Sunday. And when they say, why? Well, because my pastor said it would be a good idea. Oh, no, maybe don't say that. Because you might hear something that will change your life. We have a, oh, brothers and sisters, we have a message worth proclaiming, right? I stand, we sung, I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us proclaim it to the ends of the earth. Don't we delight when we send missionaries off? When we see missionaries taking forth the gospel to Indonesia and Africa and China and all over the world, we celebrate that they're taking the gospel to the ends of the earth and we're in the ends of the earth right now. And praise the Lord, take them to Africa. And praise the Lord, take it into Manurewa. 
and beckon them to come in and hear of Christ crucified. But the power of the cross, the folly of the cross, yes, it is indeed a message of folly to the world. But the proclamation of Christ crucified to us, to us who are being saved, I trust, oh, how I pray that that is true of you. Those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Brothers and sisters, be of good cheer. You look to a cross that the world scorns. You look to the glory of the cross. And what do you see? You don't see an enemy, do you? You see a saviour. You see love. You see the infinite grace and mercy of God. Brothers and sisters, think about it. He sent his son and he killed him on a cross. So that people like you and I would be set free. Me. Who am I that God would show mercy on me? We're no ones. We're nobodies. We are the perishing ones. And yet it is the power of God to make us the being saved ones. Not the saving yourself ones, but the being saved ones. Who are these people? It's you and I. What's taken place? We were exactly like the perishing ones. Some of us, some of us looked at the cross like the thief on the cross. Remember? Oh, look at this guy. Look at Jesus dying on a cross, heaping scorn on him. And what happened? Like that. Something changed. And it was not folly. It was a savior. And he looked to him. And he saw grace. And mercy. And love. And peace. It was the power of God unto salvation working out right before his very eyes. It's exactly what we see in John 9. A stunning illustration. Remember the blind guy in Joshua? Joshua, what am I talking about? John. The blind guy in John, and Jesus comes and heals him, and then poof, disappears again. And the blind guy ends up before the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, and they grill him. And the blind guy schools all of them and makes them look like absolute muppets. It's just 10 out of 10 reading. He just makes them look like idiots. Because his eyes have been opened to behold the wonder and the power of God. And an unschooled, rejected, hated, blind beggar becomes smarter than the religious elite of Israel. And remember what happens? He walks out after being excommunicated, after kicked down. What does he do? He bumps into Jesus. He just bumps into Jesus. Oh, he doesn't bump into Jesus. Jesus finds him, it says. He seeks him out. And he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? What does he say? Oh, that I could see him, that I might believe in him. And Jesus says, you have seen him. And he falls down. He says, I believe. And he worships him. Is that what's happened to you? That's what happens when your eyes are opened. You must be born again. That's how this works. You're a fool and you see folly and God comes and gives you new eyes. He comes and regenerates your soul. He lifts up your face to behold the glory of the cross. Has that happened to you? If, you, if it hasn't, you've got no hope. You can't believe your only hope is that God would open your eyes. Plead with him for mercy. And plead for your loved ones. Plead for your friends. Pre plead for the people in your church. Plead for this world. That they might have eyes to behold the glory of the cross. Because it is the power of the cross. The power of God. Remember what Paul says. 
I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation. That's where your hope is found. That's where your hope is found. Because a place of folly and shame and ridicule. Do you remember them? Do you remember in there? Oh, let God save him if he would have him. Let him save himself. And what happens? The same thing that happened at the KGB headquarters. Have you ever read about the KGB headquarters? One day it was a glorious building of power and there was a great big statue of the leader whose name I can't pronounce. And then communism fell. And one day, the writer says, he went back to visit the same place and do you know what he found? He found a cross standing where the statue no longer was and someone had written upon this cross. This... This is where real power is found. Isn't that what takes place at the cross? This, this, this is where great power is found. You know, there was an early church father called Cyril of Jerusalem. Cyril of Jerusalem, and he said this. Let us not be ashamed of the cross of our Savior, but rather glory in it. Glory in it, for it is the power of God. You see, the, the, the cross of Christ, the, the proclamation of the crucified Savior becomes, becomes something far more glorious. But, but just like a, a t-shirt, you know, like people get these cheesy t-shirts with slogans of stuff and hats with slogans that they want to show off to everyone. Everyone remembers mega hats, right? It was like, yeah, mega hats and all over the States. We've got a big cross on our head. A big cross on our chest. And we go around and say, I worship a crucified Lord, but He lives. He lives. He lives. You see, the, the Corinthians, they're tempted, like you and I, to boast in all the wrong things, right? They're tempted to boast in all the wrong things. And yet there's only one thing that'll last. And like one of those, those three-dimensional puzzles. Have you ever done one of those three-dimensional puzzles? You get like a bunch of pieces of wood and you click them all together. And there's always that one centerpiece that you have to put in. And when you pull that out, what happens? falls down like the centerpiece of the puzzle the cross of Jesus Christ like the centerpiece of civilization we hold up the place of power we hold up the place of power and we discover something that Dr. Lyman Abbott discovered you've probably never heard of Dr. Lyman Abbott he's not really worth remembering to be honest he was an evolutionist Actually, he is worth remembering for this reason, but he was an evolutionist, he was a social reformer, he was a social gospel believer, and he was a pastor. That sounds like a good mix, I know. And, and he was pushing for social reform and social change, and one day he resigned. He resigned from his church, and in his letter of resignation, he wrote this, I see that what I had once hoped might be done for my fellows through schemes of social reform and philanthropy can only be done by the influence of Jesus Christ. There is no power in reform save the cross of Jesus Christ. Is that your view of the cross? people of God may it be so let's pray <clears throat> Father in heaven 
We thank you so much for the cross of Jesus. Oh, to see the day, the dawning of the day of the death of Christ. What a day of shame and mockery and horror, and yet what a glorious day it is. For in that dark veil, in that dark place of sin and scorn, we find your power. Oh, Lord, would you help us to live for the cross? Help us to glory in the cross. May we not be ashamed of the gospel. Oh, Lord, may we stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen.